Okay, I just want to welcome everybody here. Thanks for coming. And uh, tonight we're going to be studying because it's going to be a thinking lecture. This uh, we're going to be looking at the bigger picture. That means we're not going to zoom in on any kind of topic. We're going to zoom out and we're going to try and see the whole picture. There is a huge gap in the minds of Christians as such, between their religion and science. There shouldn't be a gap like that. <laughs> because science and religion is the same thing. Um, and hopefully we'll be able, during tonight and tomorrow, when we'll be do part two of the series as well, uh, we'll be able to bridge that gap. So that is the aim of it, so that we can see the bigger picture of what's going on around us and how we fit into it and where we fit into it. So that's where we're going. Now there's a lot more behind what we're going to receive tonight than what you will see and what, you, what you're going to hear. I've been thinking about this subject for the best part of 40 years. <laughs> Why? And I'm going to go over the history of it uh, in the lecture because it all started uh, at the end of my matric year when things started stirring in me. Only years later I realized it was the Holy Spirit thing, but I didn't realize it then. And uh, with the exact sciences, which is my background, I'm an ex science teacher, uh, with the exact sciences it is a lot different than, for instance, the humanities. The humanities, for every answer, there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of creativity that you can apply there with history and with philosophy and business and all of that. But when you're busy with the exact sciences, for every question, there's only one correct answer. And all the other answers are wrong. <laughs> That's where I come from. And in terms of birthing what we're going to be teaching this weekend, uh, we've gone and explored a lot of wrong avenues. Hopefully I've been down most of them. How do you know you've been down a wrong avenue? When you go into some logical paradox and you say to yourself, this can't be. And then you know you've made a turn somewhere, and then you've got to retrace your steps back to where you've made a turn and go somewhere else. So I've visited over the years, and it's the best part of 40 years, as I said, four decades, uh, visited most, hopefully, of the wrong answers. We're not going to teach that tonight. <laughs> hopefully we're going to go down a straight path with what I consider to be reality, uh, on the one hand, and truth on the other hand. Um, with the exact sciences, it is so that when you have a theory about something, and reality does not agree, then reality is the senior partner. That means reality has the last say. Then you have to go and revise your theory. You can't change reality to adjust to your theory. It doesn't work that way. Reality has the last say. How do we determine what reality says? You do an experiment. And when the experiment says, sorry, your theory is wrong, then it's wrong. Then you have to go and re-explore. And I've been down many of those avenues during the years. Um, I hope that you will be blessed by it tonight, that you will be blessed by it tomorrow. Um, I'll give you a guarantee, and I can just as well do it now. Say goodbye tonight to your thinking, the way you've thought about life and the place where you live and the environment that you live in. Because after this weekend, you're going to be thinking very, very different. Hopefully more wisely and more in context than you've thought before. I'm not going to try and confuse you. It's going to be difficult, but hopefully it will enrich you and give you a lot of answers that you couldn't answer before. And that's really my wish for you. And that you will see the wonderful 
creativity of our Creator in all of that. And how He has destined us to be part of all of this, to understand all of this, and to live out His kingdom in all of us. Because that's the bigger picture. That's why we're here. So, okay, so are you ready? The title of the lecture is a bigger picture, the recent Big Bang, recent Big Bang, and other gigantic tales. The giants we're going to be talking about tomorrow. I need your permission in terms of two things. And if you don't give me permission for that, I'm sorry, but then you'll have to leave the room <laughs> for the rest of the night. Because then, uh, then you might not find what we do here acceptable for yourself. The first thing that I need your permission for is, may I offend you? <laughs> Why do I ask that? Because I'm going to challenge a lot of your thinking patterns that you've thought about until today. And you might feel offended. You might say to yourself, as we say in Afrikaans, Ach nie man eben, jy krap nou waar dit nie jak nie. And the second thing that I need your permission for, may I challenge your mind and stretch it somewhat. And you're going to feel the stretch tonight. I know you don't believe me at this point in time. You'll believe me tomorrow. <laughs> Do I have your permission? Yes. For both? Yes. Thank you very much. There was a wise guy who said no great discovery was ever made in science except by one who lifted his nose above the grindstone of details and ventured onto a more comprehensive vision. Who said that? Who knows? Someone we all know. Well-known person. Albert Einstein. And he was qualified to say that because he was the person in the 20th century who changed our way of thinking about our environment completely. The way we understood the universe changed fundamentally from before Einstein to after Einstein. There's another guy that said, one can choose to go back towards safety or forward toward growth. Why is it safer back there where you've been and not so safe where you're going now? Why is that most of the time the case? Because it's familiar. Because it's familiar. Mm -hmm. The unfamiliar, the unknown scares people. Mm -hmm. So it's always better where you've been. You, 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 you know your own demons. <laughs> yeah. um, you don't know. It's, it's difficult to put your foot across the side of a boat and put your weight on the water. <laughs> That's difficult. This guy also said, growth must be chosen again and again. And believe me, this weekend you'll have to make that choice for yourself as well. And he said, fear must be overcome again and again. That fear of the unknown will have to overcome. Who said that? <coughs> Once again, a guy who was qualified to say something like that. Most of us will know his name. Abraham Maslow. The guy who is very well known for his hierarchy of needs in psychology. The aim of this lecture is the following. Most people live completely aimless, identityless, and unaware of the long-term significance of their earthly existence. If I ask you tonight, tell the guy next to you what is the long-term sense of your earthly existence, would you be able to answer him immediately? <laughs> Maybe after a while, you'll need some thinking time, <laughs> but not immediately. Most of us don't, in the normal run of things, think about these things. Moreover, the typical 20 minutes church sermon on Sundays is hardly designed to educate us concerning kingdom principles and mechanics, but simply serves as a motivator to show up again next Sunday for our next 20 minutes motivational speech based on some Bible verse. <laughs> because that's, wh that's what sermons are. Such an individual could be compared to a car driver doing social media on his cell phone 
who rarely looks up to see what's ahead and never consults his rear view or side mirrors. He has no idea what's happening around his vehicle. Do you encounter these people on the streets of Cape Town and the roads of Cape Town? They always happen to be in front of my vehicle. <laughs> such drivers are dangerous drivers. And such Christians are oblivious Christians. And we have many, many such Christians. You will never wear a t-shirt, shorts or slops in Antarctica, would you? No, it's going to be freezing cold. Mr. Delivery will never deliver your fast food at your address with a fighter plane. You will never discuss pop music and the weather at the job interview. You won't shout province in a church service. What are we trying to say? One's surroundings determine one's behavior. So if you are not aware of what your surroundings is all about, you might be shouting province in a church service and not know it. So that's what the aim of this teaching is this weekend. And precious few folks take any note of their surroundings or whence those surroundings originated or where they are heading. The aim of this series is to inform you concerning your surroundings so that you can adapt your behavior, your physical surroundings, as well as your spiritual environment. And those two are deeply weaved together. Where they come from and where they are getting. You probably think that you understand your surroundings. You might say to me tonight, even I know this stuff. You probably think you have a working knowledge concerning the origin of your environment and how this environment will play out in the long term. You probably think that you are sufficiently adapted to your surroundings and that your life is aligned with them. Our guarantee before we start off with this lecture is the following. During this lecture, you might probably find your current worldview dramatically lacking because we're going to introduce you to at least some stuff you never thought about. You might also find that your mind lacks sufficient space to fathom the immensity of what we'll be introducing to you in this series. You're going to get that <laughs> feeling in your head. <laughs> you don't believe me at this stage? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Our sincere wish and anticipation is that you will, after the series, start to live radically different. And this, this information might empower you with a measuring rod to judge the merits of the phenomena you might encounter in life. Your world might prove to be dramatically larger and appear a lot different than you have believed until today. Are you looking forward? <laughs> this series consists of two parts. Number one, an investigation into the physical world in which we live. And number two, an investigation into the spiritual world in which we live. We have to clear out some terminology with one another. When in this series we refer to something or someone being stupid, we don't mean to say that such an entity is dumb. It's not dumb. A dumb entity lacks thinking ability. That's not what we're trying to say. But someone who is stupid has all thinking ability he might need, but he's simply not using it. <laughs> right, that's what we mean by the term stupid. Ready, ladies and gentlemen? Here we go. The background of this lecture. When did this lecture really start? During my matric year in 1981. At the end of it, actually. What happened then? For the annual prize grieving of my school, I was allowed to choose a prize book to the amount of my prize money. I chose Cosmos by the famous American astrophysicist Carl Sagan. Do you remember the series that was on TV many decades ago at the start of TV in South Africa? If you, if you remember that, you're giving away your age. I almost devoured this book. In it, Sagan quotes the British scholar Edwin Abbott with his famous thought experiment of flatland. Whom of you are familiar with the flatland principle? Nobody. 
Okay. Its story put me on a lifelong journey of dimensional thoughts. After school, this book was one of my primary motivators for taking on BSc with physics and maths as majors at university. Another book that I came across while at university and which greatly influenced my worldview was Beyond Death's Door by Dr. Maurice Rawlings, a cardiac surgeon. In this book, Dr. Rawlings, a former atheist, relates his experiences with dying patients and what they told him after resuscitation. Because he was a cardiac surgeon, he many times had to resuscitate patients. This book made the spirit world real to me and set my mind a thinking. The thing that happened to this <coughs> Dr. Rawlings was that he was used to resuscitating patients and which included, of course, heart massage. Now, he's a big guy, he's a strong guy. And he says, usually, when he would res resuscitate the patient and he would come to, uh, then he would say, stop, you're hurting me because he's a big, strong man. He said, and one day, this guy was coming to, and he said to him, go on, go on, I'm in hell. <coughs> Maurice Rawlings was an atheist. And that night, he went home and he took his Bible and dusted it off. And that incident caused him to become a believer. What's that? <laughs> That's a line of numbers, as we learned in primary school. The getalle line, or no yellow The line of numbers, or the x-axis. Then later on in high school, you met another axis in maths called the y-axis at 90 degrees and with a point of intersection between the two. And then when you go to university, you encounter a third axis, the z-axis, which goes at right angles to the previous two, both of them. That line goes into the page, in other words, into the page and out of the page. That is flatland. Flatland is a world that I want to introduce you to tonight. It's a thought experiment. Einstein said it's no danger of doing thought experiments because you can't transgress any laws. <laughs> so you're free to do what you want. Okay, that's flatland. Flatland is not like our, like our world. In our world, we have an x-axis. We have we call it length, we have a y-axis, we call it width or breadth, and then we have a z-axis, which we call height or depth. How do I add another axis? At that point of intersection, how can I add a fourth axis at right angles to the previous three, so that it intersects at the same point? How do I do that? Any suggestions? If you find out how to do it, please don't tell anybody before you tell me. Because you and I, we are going to get the world famous. Because up to this point today, it was impossible. <laughs> Question. Why is it impossible? Why was it perfectly fine to have length, x-axis, breadth, Y axis and height. The Z axis. One, two, three such axes, and it's perfectly fine. But the moment you want to add a fourth one, it's impossible. What is so bad about four and so good about one, two, and three? Why is four is four just not allowed? Have you ever thought about that? Because we are sitting in a cage tonight. A cage in which God put all of us. Called three dimensions. And we cannot get out of this cage. 
You cannot go to four and you cannot go to two either. You sit trapped in three dimensions. Why? Because God put you here. God decided three is okay, four is not. <laughs> what is flatland? This is our thought experiment to better understand our surroundings. Flatland is flat. Flatland is like a piece of paper, a sheet of paper, but it's much bigger. Let's do it horizontal for our thought experiment. And we say to ourselves, you have an infinitely large, perfectly straight piece of paper. In other words, if I stand here, it stretches out there across the horizon. It stops somewhere there and there. 360 degrees around me stretches out this flat piece of paper. That's flat land. Imagining it as a piece of paper has one difficult difficulty though. A sheet of paper is much too thick. If you stack up a thousand pieces, uh, sheets of paper, uh, you can measure the thickness with a ruler and you can divide it by a thousand and you're going to get a fraction of say a millimeter which is going to be a very small number but it's going to be greater than naught. The thickness of flatland is exactly naught. In other words, if you stack up a thousand flatlands above onto one another the resulting thickness will be naught. You can go and test it. Naught plus naught plus naught plus naught a million times ends in naught. <laughs> it's going to take you some time to do that, but that's what happened. Flatland is flat because it has no height. It has only length and width. And flatland is not only a land, it has inhabitants. There's a little pink one, a feminine one, called Sally. Sally is a circle. And you're all aware from school days that circles have no thickness. They only have length and width. Right? And uh, there's another guy there, his name is John. John is a square. <coughs> And he's blue, he's male. And there's a third guy called Mike. Mike is a triangle, but Mike has a problem. Mike has a hole in the middle. And they scurry around in Flatland and they do their business. What kind of business do Flatlanders do? They do flat business. <laughs> They all live in flats. They drink flat coke and their tires are flat. <laughs> there are houses in Flatland. That house has its door open and when you close the door in Flatland, you are perfectly private if you are inside. Why? When they look at one another, what do they see? They just see a line. What is a line? A line has only length. It has no width. In other words, if you draw a line with a pencil, your pencil's got to be very, very sharp. <laughs> because it has no width. It has, oh, it's one dimensional. It has only length. And when they look at one another, they just see a line segment. That's all they see of, of one another. So nobody can see inside a closed home. And nobody can see the hole inside of Mike because they are looking at his skin. Where do they have skin? John has skin only on the sides where he is in contact with his environment. We also have skin only where we are in contact with our environment. We don't have skin around your heart and another skin around your lung and, and that kind of thing because you're not in contact with your environment there. You have skin where you are in contact with your environment. Same so with the flatlanders. Why are you private when you're inside a closed home? Because nobody can look across the wall. <laughs> because you can't lift your head in flatland because there's no height. 
it doesn't need a roof because where would rain come from? Uh, there's no rain that can come from above because there is no above. Are you all with me? Funny land, eh? <laughs> and when Mike looks at Sally, he cannot tell that she is a circle because he sees only a line. To tell that Sally is a circle, he has to take a little tour right around her and maybe let his hand go around on her body to see where she have, has curves. And uh, if he gets to John, he has to do the same thing to determine that he is a square and where his corners are and so on and what is the length of his side and so on. But they cannot tell with one glance, they can't tell what each other's shape would be. They only see a line. Are you all okay with that? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's flat land. Do you all know these small rubber balls that we, sp that we play bats and ball with on the beach? One day, such a rubber ball arrives in the region of Flatland. And he hovers above the surface of Flatland. And he becomes very interested in the Flatlanders and their flat business. Sound is interdimensional. So as they speak to one another, he learns their names because it sound travels towards him. And he learns that there's a Sally, there's a John, and there's a Mike. And uh, he thinks Sally is very, very cute. And he wants to make contact with her and draw her attention. So he, from above, now you must realize that a ball is, is a sphere, he's three-dimensional. He's in the third dimension, he's above flat land. Right? So he calls out at Sally down below and he says, Sally! Sally hears him. To her it sounds as if the voice is coming right from the uh, inside. And it's a very strange experience for her. And she looks around her and she looks at who's calling me and she sees nobody looking at her so she says, okay, maybe I just imagined it. And she goes on with her flat, flat business. And the rubber ball decides maybe I sh should shout hard, harder and call harder. So he says, Sally! And Sally, Sally says to herself, I've definitely heard something now. John, was it you calling me? John says, no, I didn't call you. Mike, was it you? Mike says, no, man, I'm not even looking at you. So Sally says to herself, that's very strange. I'm sure I heard something. And the rubber ball, who is an intelligent rubber ball, realizes she cannot, she's not aware of him because he doesn't exist in her world. So he lowers himself to the surface of flatland. And when his surface just, just touches the surface of flatland, he suddenly appears in their world. What do they see? Just a point zero dimensions because he's just touching and as he goes deeper into the surface of flatland what happens then what do they see they see a circle but they're not aware that it's a circle they just see a line that's going longer as he goes deeper into because the circle is getting bigger do you agree yes. until he's halfway through if he would go f through further then the it, the, the line segment would, would shrink again. Okay? And they say to themselves, what is this? This is supernatural. We've never seen something like that. We can't do that. That thing is changing its own shape. Let's think about the name for that. A word for that. A verb. Shape-shifting. That thing is shape-shifting. But John is a very, very brave flatlander. And he says to himself, I'll go closer and I'm going to touch that thing to find out what it is. So he goes closer and he sniffs at it before he touches it. He says, it smells like rubber. Rubber, it smells like sulfur. This thing is evil, he tells the other. This thing that appeared in our world now, this thing is evil. And then he goes and he touches the rubber ball with his flat little hand. And for, to the rubber ball, it's extremely ticklish. 
and he jumps aside because of the tickles. And as he jumps aside, he bumps into Sally. And he bumps into her so hard that he sends her aloft. He knocks her right out of the plane of flatland into the third dimension. And Sally has a supernatural experience. For the first time in her life, she sees her own world from above. And it's a whole different perspective. Because now suddenly with one glance she can see the shapes of all her friends. She can see into closed homes and what's happening there. She can see right into the bodies of her friends. She can see how their blood system is circulated. She can see how their food digests in their stomachs. And she sees the guys who smoke, how they draw in the smoke and how they blow it out and how the tar forms on the layers of their lungs. But under the gravity of flatland, she, like a leaf, she goes again back down to the surface of flatland. To her friends, it seemed as if she had just vanished, poof, into nothing quickly. And when she comes back and hits the surface of flatland, she appears out of nothing. And they rush off to her and they say to her, where have you been? What has happened now? And Sally says, I'm not exactly sure where I've been. I feel a little bit disorientated at the moment. I think I've been up. They say, up? Where is that? And she says, I can't show you. Because everywhere she would point would just be in the plane of flatland. And they pat the pink round back. They say, there's always been a little bit of insanity in your family. <laughs> now that's where the story of Flatland ends for tonight. <laughs> what have you learned? This is a story that I was confronted with at the end of my trick. What have you learned? You might think of this Flatlander and say to yourself, man, they, they are a bit primitive, aren't they? They need a little bit of education, don't they? But add one dimension to this situation and you are where we are. And maybe there are other beings that think of us as we think about flatlanders. Who think that we are a bit primitive and that we need some education. Who would they be? They would be those in the fourth dimension. And you say, Ibn, where's the fourth dimension? I have the same problem that Sally has. I don't know. I can't show you where it is, because wherever I point is just in the three dimensions. But consider this, if I took my pen and I would go to that screen and hold the point of this pen, the very tip of it, one millimeter above John. It, would he be aware of it? No, it doesn't exist in his world. It's one millimeter too far. Is the tip of the point very close to him? Yes. It's only one millimeter away. Actually, I could drive the spin right through his body and he wouldn't even see it coming. I hope you sleep well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Flatland it is <laughs> in Flatland it's a very bad thing to have a hole in the middle like Mike but 
Fortunately, nobody knows in Flatland about the hole in the middle of Mike, because they only look at his skin, you can only see his skin. But when Sally was up there, she saw it. And she saw his shame. It was open to her. Now, in our situation, there might be entities in the fourth dimension who can look at us and see our shame right lying open in front of them. That we have always, they look right into the closet where we keep our dark things. Okay, are you happy with Flatland? And with our three dimensions? And with the fourth dimension that could be? So let's talk about the realms. We are all familiar with the first, the second and the third dimension. We've worked with it at school and we work with it every day. We're going to give a collective name to that and that would be the natural realm. We all know it, we're very familiar with it. And the fourth dimension, up to the eleventh dimension, we're going to give also a collective name. And we're going to say that is the spirit realm. Where is the spirit realm? I cannot show you. But what I can guarantee you is that it is extremely close to us. Look at me quickly. If it calls to us, it would sound as if this voice comes from inside. Why 11 dimensions? Later on in the lecture, we'll see. Who are the inhabitants of the physical realm? Here where we live. Uh, who lives here? Who are alive? What are the kind of things that we get here? People, we get animals, what else? We get plants, what, what else do we get that, that's alive? Yeah, no matter. We get a lot of inorganic, inanimate things like rocks and stones and earth and lava and magma and all of that kind of th We're not talking about that. The elements? Yes. Bacteria and viruses. Bacteria and viri. Oh, okay. yeah. Microorganisms. Most of them are either plants or animals. But there's one group of them that we can't classify as one of those and that is the viri. The viri are so simple, they are so small, that they don't have the elements of either a plant or a, an animal. We, we can't say they don't have a tooth or a hair or a leaf or a root or something like that. that, that we can say this is a plant <laughs> or this is an animal, right? So the viri sort of sits in between. What else do we have here in the natural realm that's alive? We have humans, we have animals, we have plants, we have microorganisms. What else? I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it. That's all we got. <laughs> and it's almost a shock to you when you realize that's all we got. The animal kingdom is varied. The plant kingdom is varied, yes. But that's, we have only four types of things here. And the viruses we, we never see. So we only see two others than ourselves. Right? That's the natural world. We have plants, we have viruses, we have animals and humans. Who are the inhabitants of the spiritual realm? So angels? So angels. Lazan, what are angels? What, what for a thing is an angel? You see, you see, we can't see them. So we have to explain to one another when we say angel, what do we mean? What does the word angel mean? It means messenger. That's basically what an angel is. We don't know what they are. We simply know from the Bible what they do. Because the name angel is a job description. It doesn't tell you what it is. Right? They are messengers. 
And no, angels don't have wings. Although the whole world of art is trying to tell us the opposite. Why do we say that? Because almost every angel that is described in the Bible, when they appear to people, what do the people think they are? They think they are other humans. Now, you would hardly think something that you encounter is another human if there are two big wings sticking out of his back. <laughs> no, angels don't have wings. They are actually very human-like, so much human-like that when they appear in our world, people think they are other humans. Okay, so there are angels in the spiritual realm. What else do we have in the spiritual realm? Demons. What for a thing, Lazan, is a demon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, they, you say they are fallen angels. What is a fallen angel? As he played rugby and he was tackled, what? <laughs> what is a demon? Help me. So, so my understanding is that demons are the spirit of the Nephilim. Yeah, or the children. Yeah, yeah. The Nephilim children that died during the... Yeah, the, the, during the flood, yes. Who are the Nephilim? The children of the fallen angels and the women of earth. The giants. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Nephilim is, is the giants, yeah. The mighty men of old. As the Nephilim we encounter in Genesis 6 were not angels, but the sons of God came to the daughters of men and had intercourse with them. And they bore, the daughters of men bore giants, the heroes of all the men of renown, as we read in Genesis 6. And then what happened to these Nephilim? In the end. Do we find them on the earth today? When did you greet and have, do business with a giant today? No. Something happened to them. What happened to them? They drowned in a big flood. That was why the flood had been sent. To get rid of these things. We get very, very little information on that whole incident in the Bible. Almost just the chapter of Genesis 6. And right after that in Genesis 7. And Noah and his ark and the big flood. But there's an extra biblical book that tells us a lot more details about what happened there. What's the name of that book? Enoch. The book of Enoch. That was in the Bible, used to be in the Bible, in the Roman Catholic Bible, until the year 600 or so, and then was thrown out. And that the Council of Rome, where the books of the Bible was finally decided upon in uh, 382 after Christ, it was thrown out of the Bible. And uh, it got lost. And got lost for so much that nobody knew anymore where to find a copy. And in the second part of this lecture tomorrow, we're going to talk a lot about that. And how it was found again. And we know today what it says. And in the book of Enoch it says that God pronounced a curse over these Nephilim. And when they drowned in the flood, something had to happen to, number one, their bodies, and something had to do with, number two, their spirits. And God said their bodies died, and it goes through the whole process of decay that any human body would go through when it dies, but their spirits will remain on the earth and they will be called evil spirits on the earth. Now what do we call evil spirits today? Demons. Demons, listen carefully because this is a teaching that goes around in many churches, Bible schools and seminaries that demons are fallen angels. They are not there are things like fallen angels, yes, but they are not demons. 
Demons are the spirits of the Nephilim and the hybrids of the pre-flood world. That's what we find on the earth today because they stay here. God said they will stay here. And they will be called evil spirits. Right. So, in the spirit world we now have angels and we have demons. What else do we have in the spirit world? That's a lie. Cherubim. What is a cherub? I don't know. I think it's like an angel with rings. <laughs> You're very right. A cherub is a heavenly being that has wings. Every time they are mentioned in scripture, they have wings. They have six wings for that matter. Not two. We have very little information about them. But there's another kind of heavenly being that always goes along with them. What are they? The seraphim. The seraphs and the cherubs. The seraphim and the cherubim. What is a seraph? Or a seraphim? <laughs> the Hebrew word suggests that both resemble the form of a snake, of a serpent. And that, which gives us indication that the serpent that spoke to Eve in the garden was one of them. And that she was quite used to speaking to them. That's why she didn't find it any big issue to speak to a serpent. Because it was a snake-like thing. With wings. Actually, when Lucifer is described in one of the major prophets, what does the prophet call him? The what that walks around the glowing embers? The cherub. Lucifer was a cherub. That's why he is depicted as a snake. So, we have angels, we have demons, we have cherubim, and we have seraphim. What else do we have in the spiritual realm? God and Lucifer. Okay, God and Lucifer. Who's Lucifer? I've just described it to you. He is a fallen cherub. He has wings. And God? Oh, we love God. We know God. God manifests in the spiritual realm in three ways. In three persons, we say. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right? And we are hopefully all, as Christians, very much aware and in love with all three of them. Right? Okay. So we have angels, we have demons, we have seraphim, we have cherubim, we have uh, God and we have Lucifer. Who else are there? What are you talking about? Revelation. <laughs> Your revelation or somebody else's revelation? The revelation of John. The revelation of John in the Bible. Tell us about the four living creatures. One has a face like a lion, one has a face like a ox, ox a human and an eagle. And where are they? Around the throne. They are in front of God's throne, in the throne room for that matter. And we don't know too much about them. There's a lot of symbolism that people ran out about them and all of that. I'm not going to go into that tonight. Who else are there in the spiritual realm? Um, human spirits. Human spirits. Oh, human spirit. Are they part of the spiritual <coughs> realm, you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. spirit. Yes. You've just set a world record. Did you know that? 
It's the first, I've taught this many times to many groups. It's the first time ever somebody mentions it. That's usually the big surprise at the end of the section. And now I can show you the rest. We have God, we have the sons of God, whom we will be talking about a lot tomorrow. Other heavenly beings, seraphim, cherubim, etc. What are the etc.? The etc. are the four living creatures. The altar in front of the throne that speaks. The thing that Ezekiel saw, the wheel within the wheel, with eyes on the rims. They are still there today. They are still there. And we are going to meet them most probably when we go there. There are Satan and fallen angels, or Lucifer you can call, and demons or devils, and then there are humans. Why have I highlighted humans in both sections? Because my fellow Christian human, very few of us ever conceptualize this. We are the only unique creation of God that lives in both realms. We have a double citizenship. You manifest in the natural realm by means of your physical body, flesh. And you manifest in the spiritual realm as well simultaneously by means of your spirit man that lives inside of your meat box, your physical body. And we are the only creature that God made of all the things that He made that is such. Except for Jesus Christ for 33 years. When He was on earth. Before He was on earth, He was in the fourth dimension or higher up. We don't know exactly where. And He was just spirit. And God, He was there when God created the world. God actually created the world through Him, says the scripture. And then, in the fullness of time, He pitched up on earth as a baby in a manger. And for 33 years he walked this earth in the form of a body. And then he departed again. And today he has a spiritual body. But he is spirit again. So what am I saying? I'm saying to you, you are unique. Our species is unique in God's creation. And that is why He sent Jesus to be just like us, as unique as He has made us. He, made, he sent Jesus to be just that. Who adds value? Now this is not really part of the lecture. I just want to make you think a little bit. Who's that? Julius. What's his name? Julius. Julius. How much value has he added to your life so that you will know his name? And you all know his name. What value did he add to your life? Okay. Who's that? The Kardashians. What value have they added to your life so that you know their names? Any value? Who's that? There's Hilton. What value has she added to your life so that you know her name? Who's that? Justin Bieber. What value has he added to your life so that you would know his name? Have any of them added any value to your life? 
now the opposite. People who have added an immense amount of value to your life. Every one of you. Who are they? Who's that? You don't have a clue. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name, but his surname was Marconi. He was the inventor of the radio. Has radio added any value to your life up till today? Very much so to everybody. Every one of us. Who's that? Bell. Bell. No, it's not Alexander Bell. Good grace. Wilhelm Röntgen, <laughs> the discoverer of x-rays. Those of you who have been in hospital, has he added any value to your life? Very much so. Who's that? A bit more well-known than the others. Who's he? Thomas Alva Edison. The inventor of the gramophone as well as the light bulb. Have those added any value to your life until now? Do you sometimes listen to music? Do you sometimes switch on a light when ISCOM allows you? Who's that? Some of you have never heard his name even. Atanasov, who built the first computer. Do you sometimes use a computer? Why don't you know the names of these people? Because they're not on social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually a very challenging question. Why don't we know these people? Hmm? They're dead, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe they don't do the news circuit anymore. But anyway, <laughs> let's, let's go on. Where do I come from? And I'm asking that for you. Ask the person next to you, and I want you to do this just now, this question. Where do you come from? The aim is not to have a bees and flowers conversation. That's not, that's not what we're aiming at. What do you believe? Have you been created? Or are you simply the result of some other fluke or random accident, depending on your self-image today? <laughs> I want you to commit today to some other explanation of where you come from, else you'd simply be without any identity. Tell the person next to you quickly, where do you come from? <laughs> and I want you to commit to your answer. Okay, whom of you had said they were created? Hands up. Most of us. Who said uh, you've been a fluke? Nobody. 